So here we are. We have made it to phylum chordata. Now this is the most recent phylum evolutionarily. This does not mean it's the best one. Now you might argue that, being like, well, humans are in this one. Of course, we're the best one. Yes, but I really want to reiterate that, again, all these other phyla still exist, right? We have not, or phylum chordata has not outcompeted other organisms, or perhaps they have, but all the organisms we talked about are current extant species. They still exist today. So while, yes, we might be the most recent, that doesn't necessarily mean we're outcompeting everything else. So phylum chordata, we're following those with the true tissues, we're bilateral, we are deuterostomes, just like phylum echinodermata. So let's take a closer look at what phylum chordata actually entails. So phylum chordata are the vertebrates, and you've probably heard that term before, and related. So vertebrates are those that have a vertebral column. We're going to explain that more in a couple slides. And this is most chordates. In this picture below, that pretty much starts somewhere between the hagfish and lampreys, and then all the way through. Most of those things you know. You know the cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks. You know ray-finned fish, like pretty much every fish. You know reptiles. You know mammals, etc. But there's also much simpler chordates, which are these first few ones, ascidians, which are sea squirts. We're not going to talk much about these initial ones. No, they exist. You might see them, especially if you go boating, uh, especially ascidians like to ha uh, latch on to boats. But for the most part, you don't see these other ones. So with all of these, whether they're the super simple ones or the more complex ones, they all share the same bilateral symmetry. And I'm going to keep making references to humans just because humans are in this phylum and it's a lot easier to visualize yourself. So we have one line of symmetry that runs vertically in humans, but for most of these it's running so that there is a left and a right. We are triploblastic individuals, and that is arranged as a U-coelomate, so we do have a true body cavity. Again, in humans, you think about our chest cavity and our abdomen cavity, our abdominal cavity. Both of those are that coelom. Hopefully you know this, but chordates have complete digestion, so there are two separate openings. There is a separate mouth and anus. And for phylum chordata, this is arranged as a deuterostome or develops as a deuterostome where the mouth is forming second. So the stome, the mouth forming second, which is the deutero, meaning that the anus is forming first. And again, this is happening when you are a tiny bunch of 64 cells and that digestive system, or at least the simple tube of the digestive system starts forming. So this is what is kind of those basic characteristics we've talked about with all of the animal phyla, but we're going to dive a little deeper because you may be wondering, okay, why are these ascidians or these sea squirts, you know, lumped in the same category as birds? Like what in the world do they have similar between each other that has put them both in the same phylum? So when it comes to phylum chordata, there are four common characteristics that every single one of those organisms have at least some time in their development. It could be just when they're an embryo. You might not actually see it as an adult. So those four characteristics, and we're going to describe each of these more in just a moment, is one, the notochord. This is actually where the name phylum chordata comes from, is the structure of the notochord. We all have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So a nerve cord, it happens to be hollow and dorsal meaning it's along the top. We have a post anal tail. So this is saying, you know, past that notochord, past that structure, there is a tail. This is also past the anus, so post anal. And then pharyngeal slits. What these develop in really depends on the organism, but it's essentially slits or slots in the pharynx area. So the pharyngeal area is the pharynx area. So thinking about humans, it's like our throat area. So let's dive into each of these individually. So the first one we'll talk about is that dorsal hollow nerve cord. 
So nerve, thinking about the nervous system, this is our ability to sense different pieces of information and interpret them and send information to other parts of the body in response. And this nerve cord, when we think about humans and a lot of our chordates, this nerve cord is essentially what becomes the spinal cord. You know, in humans, it's a spinal cord that runs down our spine. And hence the name spinal cord. Um, that's not just in humans. We see spinal cords and spines and lots of our different chordates. Not only is it the spinal cord, which is going to be sending the messages along to all parts of your body, but this is also giving rise to our brain as well. And again, brain is not unique to humans. We see brains in lots of different organisms. Now, in those super simple sea squirts, it's just a nerve cord. Like, that's it. There's no brain. There's no extensive spinal cord. It's just like this super simplistic nerve cord. And humans, a lot more complex. And in other vertebrates, a lot more complex. Birds, it's more complex. Alligators, it's more complex than, say, those sea squirts. So that's your nerve cord. Let's talk about this notochord. So this notochord, you may notice that on this slide, it's spelled without the H. On other slides, it's spelled with the H. It really depends on who you are. I spell it without the H. So this provides, I, it says skeletal support, but just support in general. The notochord is made out of cartilage. So while cartilage isn't as strong as bone, it's pretty freaking strong. I mean, think about your ear. Your ear is full cartilage, but it has shape. It has structure. And that's what the notochord is. It's this long, so literally long, uh, not tube, cylinder, long cylinder of cartilage. And cartilage is strong, and that provides body support. The This really strong structure is going to enable organisms to get larger. You know, previous to this, right, our, our organisms are not that large. We see them, but they're not elephants, right? Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. You know, we've learned about some large sea stars, maybe some large insects. Uh, I mean, we don't really have like the, so maybe some big spiders, but I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that gets larger than, say, I don't know, like two feet across or two feet high because they need a support structure. And that's what this notochord is. By having this really stiff cylinder that's going the length of that organism, you're gonna start seeing the ability for organisms to get larger and being able to support the weight of that organism. Now, you might be thinking, well, a notochord, like humans don't have that, right? Like we, we have bone, we don't have some large, cartilage cylinder disc like or cylinder running down our back like we have a backbone and you're totally right so all organisms in chordata at least in the embryo phase have a notochord have this cylinder when you are an embryo you do not have bone yet bone takes a while to develop you have a notochord at some point some of those simpler chordates, they have the notochord their entire life. In most other chordates though, in, in the chordates that you know about, reptiles, amphibians, fish, humans, that notochord gets replaced with the vertebral column. These words are not interchangeable. The vertebral column is a series of units, and I'm using the word units on purpose, a series of units that um, interlock with one another. So this image right here on the right hand side, you now there are three units, vertebrae as they're called. There's three vertebrae. Here's a picture of a shark. Also have vertebrae going down the entire backbone, uh, or sorry, entire back. Now that is not the notochord. Notochord is a single piece. Notochord is one long tube. Vertebrae, these are individual pieces. You can break these apart. These are individual pieces. So they are not the same thing. The vertebrae replace the notochord. But here's the thing, is that the notochord still remains. Yes, we had it as an embryo, but it's not like it got 
chewed up or, or, or dissolved or anything, that notochord still exists. And the way it exists is as discs between those vertebrae. So going back to this bottom picture, so yes, we have these individual vertebral units. They're independent of one another. They kind of, kind of latch into one another. But bone, rubbing on bone, not so good. Not just in your back, but like anywhere in your body. And so what exists between these vertebral units is a disc. That disc is a cartilaginous disc. It has, you know, some flex to it so that when bone rubs against it, it's, it's flexible. But that cartilaginous disc is actually remnants of the notochord. That notochord you had as an embryo, as it continues to develop, it essentially turns into those discs in between the vertebrae. So it's still present but not in its original form, not in its long cylindrical shape like we see in the adults of lancelets, which again, we're not going to talk much about. So that notochord's still there, still exists. It's just kind of in this different form in adults and most of the vertebrae. Now I keep using this term vertebrae and vertebral column. There are other terms for it. Some people call it a backbone. Some people call it a spine. So backbone, spine, vertebral column, they're kind of all interchangeable. Now, I will stick with vertebral column because vertebral column has some different implications um, because backbone implies bone, but that's not always true. And spine, because we think of humans, we usually think of bone and that's not always true either. Um, it, it's true in humans, not true in the other chordates. So I'm gonna stick with vertebral column, but if you hear the words backbone or spine, it's actually referring to the same thing. And just know the notochord, while it doesn't exist in its, I guess, original form, is still present even as adults. So this is where the whole phylum chordata comes from. That chordate is those with the notochord. All right, so what's up next? So we have our pharyngeal slits. Again, it's a super vague term, you're like, Slits, huh? Yes. So in the pharynx area, in humans, it's around your neck area, there's these slits. And if you take a look at this picture of comparative embryology, you're looking at a fish versus reptile versus bird versus humans, and that's what these purple kind of highlighted areas are, are these pharyngeal slits. What these pharyngeal slits become so dependent um, on the organism. So some examples. In some organisms, the function of these slits is to filter food. Others, it's supporting the gills. So think of things that are aquatic. For other organisms, it's supporting the jaw. So there's bones in the jaw that these slits kind of transform into. In tetrapods, so I'm gonna pause right there. So tetra means four, pod means feet. So four-footed organisms, alligators. Birds. Now you might be like, birds, they only have two feet, but they do have four limbs. Um, so that's kind of why they're included. So they're two wings and they're two feet. Cats, frogs. So tetrapods, these pharyngeal slits become parts of the ears. Think about the inner ear and some of the structures inside of our ears, as well as our tonsils, um, which are actually right around in the pharynx area. So most, most pretty much all the land chordates. Um, this is what those pharyngeal slits become. Our C chordates, like our fish and our, uh, oh my god, uh, our skates, our rays, our sharks, our hagfish, our lampreys, our everything that's in the water, it's pretty much this first thing. Filtering food, supporting the gills, supporting jaws. So this has been three characteristics. So the last characteristic is that post-anal tail. So you have the anus and then the tail is coming back or going further behind. This typically is going to have, um, it really depends, but typically it has part of the vertebral column in it. Typically it has part of the notochord in it, depending on which chordate we're talking about. This is not always true. So birds, for example, like they're tails are incredibly short and then they usually have tail feathers which is what kind of we see so they do have a tail 
it's not the same as their tail feathers. So there's no bones or anything. There's no structure in feathers. Um, so they have a tail, they have tail bones and structures that go past their anus in addition to feathers. Th that really doesn't matter. Um, so a postanal tail, what this works as really depends on which chordate we're talking about. So that tail in aquatic species, a lot of times is used for locomotion. So think about dolphins, think about sharks, think about fish. That tail is crucial for helping move that organism forward or really in any direction. For things on land, so again, our tetrapods, our four-legged friends on land, it could be used for balance. Like you see here um, with this... I want to say kangaroo, kind of looks like a wallaby, but you know, it doesn't matter. Same thing in either one. Um, so maybe used for balance. What we see in this monkey is it's being actually used as a way to support this monkey and almost be using it as another limb um, in this case. It could be used for courting like we see with this hummingbird. It could be used for communication. So thinking about cats and dogs, your pets, you know, they, especially cats, the way their tail is moving is signaling something. Now, th this is just a, a couple of examples, but if you think about any animal with a tail, you can probably even think of more examples of how that tail is useful. When it comes to humans, just to kind of bring it back to us a little bit, it's vestigial. So we have a tail bone, it kind of, you know, marks the end of our vertebral column. And that's it. There's no other structure going through, or there's no, there's no, no more structure, right? We don't have a tail. Now, I didn't want to put a slide of it, but if you want to go down a Google rabbit hole, there are humans with tails where there was a, an actual mutation that essentially when you're an embryo, you have a tail. That's what you can see here. Like we have tails as embryos and then it kind of, the rest of our body kind of fills in. In some people, there's a mutation where that gene turns off and they have a tail that grows. Google it, you won't be disappointed. Might be weirded out, might be grossed out, but you won't be disappointed. Okay, that's all I got for phylum chordata. Um, there is a video that I'll have pop up just right here at the end. This video shows you some 3D imagery. It's not, it's computer generated imagery, but it's kind of pretty good of this comparative embryology, which I th think is super cool between chordates. So looking at elephants versus fish versus chickens and how as an embryo, they look so similar because they have all of these characteristics and it's just different genes turning on and turning off that are making differences, I guess, as we are in adults. I'm gonna warn you, like the first couple, I don't know, like 30, 45 seconds are weird. It's like, Kevin Spacey singing a song. Don't know why? You can skip it. Um, when you start seeing the imagery, just start playing it there. So hopefully you learned a little bit more about how we are related to the other organisms found in Phylum Chordata. And as you finish up, go ahead and watch that video that's popping up. Bye.